Okay, hey and welcome. Thank you all for coming to our uh, first talk of our undergraduate colloquium. Um, today we have Sid, who's talking about topological data analysis, or more particular, persistent homology. C <laughs> come and start. All right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, persistent homology. Um, um, and yeah. So welcome. And it's nice to see so many people. Um, um, and hopefully, um, a lot of you come back next week when um, Tim Durek is going to talk about um, physics-informed neural networks, um, which should also be super interesting. Okay, so uh, what is the goal of today's talk? Um, so I'm not going to be talking much about what I'm doing as my thesis, which is more about the um, theoretical foundations of persistence homology, um, but I'm going to I thought it would be more interesting to introduce persistent homology in a very intuitive way so that the barrier to entry to this talk is low. So, so basic linear algebra and a bit of topology, points that topology should be enough to follow along the talk. Um, and so the outline is going to be, it's going to look something like this. So I'm going to start off with a, a bit of a motivation on what topological data analysis is and why one would use it. Um, and then I'm going to introduce um, persistent homology with with an example. So I'm not going to do much of formal definitions. I'm going to look at introducing everything with examples and pictures. Um, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about a recent application. So there, there are tons of applications of persistent homology, and I wasn't sure which one to pick, so I just went on the archive a couple of days ago and just picked out one of the recent papers uh, on um, persistent homology. And I'm going to talk about that, which displays the power of persistent homology. Um, and then if I have time, which I hope I do, I'm going to be talking a bit about a bit more in detail about the theory that underpins persistent homology, which is some very um, elegant math. Um, but I'm not sure if I get there. I hope I do within time. Okay, so that being said, let's get started with motivation. Um, so the whole idea is that data and data for 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 this talk or in topological data analysis is basically just point cloud data. So you have a discrete subset um, of Rn or any metric space. So basically, if you have data, um, you can think of them as vectors and embed them in Rn or any vector space. Um, and the idea is that these, these data sets, they have shape. So for example, if you look at these two data sets, the data set on the left, it looks somewhat like a circle. It has noise, right? It's not a perfect circle, but in some sense, it looks like a circle. On the right, it's a completely different shape. And the idea is that this shape somehow, struct, uh, this, this, it, it embodies somewhat the structure of the data, the underlying data. And the goal of persistent homology is to try and capture that data um, and see what, what structure is, is hidden in, 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 in the data. And in particular, homology lends itself uh, very well, um, and topology in general, because topology is basically the study of shapes, right? So... Um, using that for data is something that could be very um, interesting. Okay, so that being said, let's get started. Um, so before I get to persistent homology, I'm just going to give a very short uh, introduction to homology, a very intuitive introduction to homology. It's not formal at all. Um, if you want to learn more, go to algebraic topology. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about simplicial homology, which is what we're going to be using. So a simplex, an n-simplex, is basically the generalization of a triangle um, to n dimensions. So zero simplex would just be a point, a one simplex would be an edge, a two simplex is the familiar triangle, and a three simplex, which is very badly drawn here, is just a tetrahedron, which is filled in, of course. And then sticking simplices together, observing some rules, which I'm not going to get into, uh, forms simplicial complexes. So in this simplicial complex, which I've drawn here, and I'm going to use this example often, um, is basically just a bunch of one simplices. I mean, you have a bunch of vertices, which are zero simplices, a bunch of one simplices, and a sole um, two simplex there. Okay. And we want to look at the shape of these simplicial complexes, which is what simplicial homology is. Okay. And one final definition um, is that of a filtration. Uh, which is what we're going to use a lot. So a filtered simplicial complex K is just a sequence of subs, uh, of sequence of subcomplexes. So you start off, for example, I can build a filtration of this simplicial complex. I can start off with maybe two points, then I add in this one simplex, then I add in more edges, and eventually I come um, to to my simple, uh, simplicial complex that I began with, um, and that's just a filtration, um, right? Okay. 
So simplicial homology um, basically assigns algebraic invariants to simplicial complexes. So it takes in a simplicial complex, and then it spits out an abelian group um, for, each, for each dimension n. So hn, uh, for some n uh, greater than or equal to zero, spits out an abelian group. Um, and so, and, uh, yeah, and a remark, uh, we're going to be working over um, Z mod 2 and not over the integers, um, just because computers like Z mod 2 and, um, yeah, because computers like zeros and ones, and also we want to work over fields um, because persistent homology and particular barcodes don't form over um, uh, if you work over Z. So you need to work over fields, and we pick Z mod 2 because binary. Um, and over, over Z mod 2 or any field, HN of K becomes a vector space. Why? Because basically abelian groups are, are modules over, over the ring of integers, and if you have a module over a free module over a vector space uh, over a field, it becomes a vector space. Um, okay? And so visually, what does this mean? Like what 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 do the homology groups tell us or homology vector spaces? So 8-0, it tells you the number of connected components. So for example, here we have three points, and those are three separate connected components. So H0 would be um, the vector space Z2 to the power 3, and Hn would be 0 for all n greater than 0. Okay? And then H1, it counts the number of loops. So it counts, in some sense, these holes in the middle, like a like circle, basically. Um, so for this triangle, we have one connected component. So H0 is Z2. H1 is Z2 because we have this loop. And Hn is 0 for any n greater than 0 because we have no other higher dimensional characteristics within the shape. Okay? Then we jump... And dimensions, we go to a sphere. So this is a hollow sphere, S2. Um, it has one connected component, but it has no loops, right? Because if you draw this loop, for example, you can take it up and shrink it down to a point. So there are no loops. But there is a void in the middle, and that's what H2 um, captures. And then Hn is zero because there's no higher dimensional structure. But H3 and H4 and so on would capture the analogs of these in higher dimensions. Okay. And maybe a more interesting example would be that of a torus. So H0 here, it has one connected component, um, but then it has two loops, so this one and this one, and that gives me Hn, H1 to be Z2 squared, and H2, there's this one void in the middle, so it will give me Z2, and then zero for all of the other homology groups. Okay, so that was a very quick introduction to homology, not formal at all, um, and so we can move on now. Ah, uh, yeah, and why should we use homology? Um, in topological data analysis? Well, first of all, it's homotopy invariant. So for example, here we have three shapes that can be deformed into each other, right? So you can take the circle and you can squish it and form it continuously in some way to a square, and you can do the same thing, take the square and make it into a triangle. And homology, so if you calculate the homology group of this, it would be Z2, H1 of this would be Z2, as is this, as is this. So basically homology is homotopy invariant, and that's very good for calculating the shape of data because you want things that, that can be continuously deformed into each other to result in the same barcode. So homology is good. In that case, homology is a functor. If that doesn't tell you anything, basically what this means is if you have a map between two spaces, so continuous map F between X and Y, you get a map in homology. Um, right? So you have HN of X and HN of Y, and you have an induced map here. And this is very critical in constructing the bar in barcodes. So this is another very desirable feature that homology lends us. And then simplicial homology. So simplicial homology in particular is very computable. So there are other homology theories, which one learns in algebraic topology, but they're not as computable. Simplicial homology is basically linear algebra. It's row reduction. And computers can do row reduction very, very well, and we know how to do this. Um, so those are three of the reasons that one might use homology um, um, in data analysis. OK, so going back to the original problem, we want to look at the topology of point cloud data, right? So one could say, OK, let's, let's take this point cloud data. So I have, a same, I have this noisy circle. And let's say, well, I can consider all of these points as zero simplices and consider that itself as a simplicial complex. But this gives me nothing interesting. Because 80, like I said, just gives you the number of connected components so you would get Z2 to the power of number of points, which is, yeah, great. And Hn would be trivial, right? Because you have no loops. Well, we see a loop, but, but homology would not see a loop because they're all discrete points. Um, so it's not very interesting. So how do we fix this? 
Okay, so this, this is what persistence homo persistent homology answers, um, and it does this in the following way. So we have a pipeline. So you, f you start off with data. So for example, the noisy circle. From this data, you use um, something called the Viatoris Rips complex to build a filtered simplicial complex, which we talked about earlier. Okay, so we have a filtered simplicial complex. We have K0, K1, Kn. And then in, to each of these, we can apply homology, right? So we get HI of K0, HI of K1, and so on. Remember now functoriality. So we have here inclusions. We have inclusion maps. This gives me a map here. This gives me a map here. This gives me a map here because of functoriality. And this is what we call a persistence module. And then because of some very elegant algebra, uh, we can form a structure theorem, which is very analogous to the structure theorem for modules, and get a barcode out of this. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the basic idea. And I'm going to look at this now um, and try to apply it to the circle um, to illustrate how, how the barcode actually works. OK, so the first step is to go from point cloud data to simplicial complexes. OK, so consider the same example. We have the circle. I've just reduced it down to 10 points so that it doesn't get as messy and so that we can actually see something, all right? So let x denote the data set. And again, we have h0 is z2 to the power 10 because there are 10 points, and hn is 0 for all n greater than 0. OK, and now let's build a simplicial complex by playing a sort of game. So, so the formal definition is as follows. You, 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 let, you pick an epsilon greater than 0, a parameter, a real number, um, and define a simplicial complex. So this vr stands for vr torus rips. So you take in the data set and an epsilon, um, and your vertices are simply the points. So all of your points form one of the vertices. And then given um, a subset of x, so x0 through xn, so maybe uh, these two points, the, the, the simplex spanned by these two points is included in my simplicial complex if and only if they're within epsilon um, distance of each other. Um, that sounds a bit um, weird, but... but um, but how it actually works is very simple, right? So, so for example, in, in our case, um, we start with, let's say, epsilon 1. So you draw balls of radius epsilon 1 around each of, these, each of these points. And then I see, okay, all of these points are not within epsilon distance of each other, except, except for these two. So these two span a simplex. And what do two points span? They span a one simplex. Um, and let's look at what this does to our homology. Homology in H0, it decreases by one, right? Because you cut down the connected components by one, because these two points are now connected. But Hn remains trivial for all other n. Okay, so then you might say, let's, let's increase epsilon and see what happens. If you increase epsilon again, uh, these two points get connected, these two points, and so on, right? And now your H0 is just cut down to Z2 because you have only one connected component. H1 is also pretty interesting now because you have two loops. You have one loop here, and you have one loop here. But this is, again, counterintuitive, like, not what we want, right? Because these two points are basically our noise, and, it's, and we don't want that to show up in our H1. So we have H1 is Z2 squared, whereas we just want it to be Z2. Um, so how do we fix this? You might say, all right, there was no reason why epsilon 2 was the right choice. Let's increase it to epsilon 3. If you increase it to epsilon 3, all of these four points are within epsilon 3 distance of each other. And what do... Um, three, uh, four points span, they span a tetrahedron. So this circle gets filled in. It was not filled in here, it got filled in here, and then maybe you add these triangles because these three points were within each other and these three points were within each other. But the main loop, the central feature of our data set remains preserved, right? So our H0 is what we want, our H1 is what we want. But again, this epsilon 3 is rather arbitrary. So let's jump up again to epsilon 4 and then maybe you get this. But our circle in the middle is still preserved. Eventually, however, you can keep increasing epsilon n, but at some point you can't go on, right? Because at some point all of the points would be within that epsilon n distance of each other. Uh, and so the whole thing would get filled in and you would have one connected component and no other interesting features. So you might ask, how do you pick your epsilon? And that's, that's the genius of persistent homology. You don't pick it, you just use all of it. You just use every single epsilon. <laughs> right, and then you look at what the what, what the barcodes form. So your barcode basically for H zero, for example, you you look at what your homology groups uh, were. So at time zero, we had ten connected components. So I had 10, uh, 10, 10, 10 bars in the beginning. 
when I, when I jumped up to epsilon one, one of these components died. And so I have only nine connected, uh, nine connected components. Jump up to epsilon two, all of these died because if you remember epsilon two connected all of these points and you have only one connected component and this connected component survives, persists the entire way. Um, and and, and the, the, the story is that you, you consider the, the short-lived bars as noise and the long-lived bars as what your features are actually encoding. Okay, um, H1 is a bit more interesting. So here's our filtration again, um, as, as was above. So I've just drawn it again. Um, so at time one, so this filtration, H1 was trivial. So we have no, no loops. At time two, two loops are formed. We have this green loop and we have this pink loop. Um, and we look at what happens to the green loop in time three, it dies. So we stop that. This, these are half open intervals, so it dies in time three. However, the pink loop or the purple loop, it survives until time five over here, where we again kill it off. Um, and that's, that's basically what a persistence barcode is. And you get this for each HI, for, for every integer I, you get, you get a barcode. Um, all right, so just a remark, which we're going to use in our discussion of the application that I, that I talked about, um, is that from a barcode, you can go, so a barcode is one representation, a persistence diagram is the other representation, and you can go from one to the other relatively easily. Um, so for example, here uh, for H1, uh, we had this, this, green, this green loop. It was born at time two, and it died at time three. So in my persistence diagram, I have birth on the x-axis and death on the y-axis. So at time two and time three, I plot that like that. And for the purple one, it died at was formed at time two and died at time five. So I plotted like that. And all of your points will be above the diagonal because you can't die before you're born. So, yeah. <laughs> and in the persistence diagram, what, what you say is, so in, in your persistence barcodes, your short intervals are noise. So for example, this green, this green bar is noise because of those two points, these outliers. Um, and the long intervals are your features. And your persistence diagrams, if you're, you're, your points close to the diagonal are noise because you're born very, uh, you're bor your lifespan is very short, right? You're born and then you die immediately. Um, yeah, so, so that's persistence uh, barcodes and persistent, persistence diagrams um, introduced. Okay. Um, and with this, we can look at a recent application. Um, so, like I said, there are tons of applications of persistent homology from, from material science um, to medicine to, bio, uh, to biology. And this is one of, the one of the papers I found on the archive when I was looking up applications um, two days ago for the talk. And, of course, uh, it's something to do with medicine and with everything medicine, every medicine paper that's published in the last two years, it's COVID-19 related. So uh, what these people did was they looked at certain... Um, cell data, so, so they took um, data from infected patients and health, healthy patients and looked at protein expression data uh, from these, from these um, patients. And um, in an earlier paper uh, that was published, uh, what they noticed was infected patients, these cell expression data, the shape looks different from that of the healthy patients. Now this, this is process data, so it's, it's, the actual data set is very high dimensional and the earlier the earlier paper, what they did was they applied some data processing and they, they came up with this scatter plot. Uh, but the point is topological data analysis can take in just the high dimensional data and look at the underlying features. So th this is what um, the authors did. They wanted to apply topological data analysis to this uh, protein expression data. Okay, so my, because, they, because yeah, they noticed that the shapes are inherently different and they wanted to investigate that further. Okay, so... The data set is protein expression data of a certain kind of cell. So you, from each donor, you get, you get a bunch of... Uh, so each cell gives you protein expression data, and from each donor, you get a population of cells, right? Um, so that's your point cloud. Oh, whoops. Um, and from each donor, then you can, you can construct a persistence diagram, like we did for our toy data set. They did that for, for their protein expression data. Okay. And then what they did was they selected, they randomly selected pairs of either healthy, healthy donors, which are HH, or healthy infected HP. I think P is patient. I'm not sure why they say it's HP, but anyway. Um, and then they computed the distance of the persistence diagrams for each pair. So they looked at, okay, I have, I have two persistence diagrams, healthy, healthy, and what is the distance between these persistence diagrams? Um, so maybe... 
a remark, on persistence diagrams, you can define a, a, a version of the Wasserstein distance. So you can, in some sense, quantify the distance between two persistence diagrams. Um, so here, if you had two persistence diagrams, you could compute the distance between a persistence diagram A and a persistence diagram, well, this is a barcode, but a persistent diagram B. And that's what they did. They did, they computed the distances for healthy, healthy pairs and healthy infected pairs. And the reason they're doing this um, this way is because they want to avoid, uh, there was apparently some noise when, when you, the, the data varies from donor to donor, and so this isolates that effect by considering it like this. And then they asked the question, is the distribution of distance for HH different from distributions for HP? Because then this would, this would imply that there is an actual structural difference in the cell protein expression data between infected patients and those of healthy patients. And so this is what they came up with. So you have three axes here. For, so they picked the three most, what they uh, found were the three most important protein expressions, most important proteins. And on the left column, you have healthy, and on the right column, you have infected. So you start off with this point cloud, right, for both of them. And then you have two persistence diagrams. So you have H0 for the healthy and H0 for the patient. So this is connect, com, com, computing connected diagrams. And then you have H1 for both the healthy and the patient, right? So they, they, they have these four. And then you get, uh, and then taking a lot of patients, a lot of these pairs, you want to compute um, the distribution. So what they found was that the distance, so, so HP is this orange curve and HH is the blue curve. So for both H0 and H1, what they found was that the distribution of the distances between HH and HP were, uh, were, were different. And they had a certain p-value to decide this. I'm not going to go into the statistics there. Um, but basically what this means is that there is a structural difference in the protein expression data between the, between the healthy versus the infected patients, uh, which reflects the shape of the data. Um, and now you might ask, well, what, what, what new information did persistent homology tell me that I could not have gotten by other means, right? Um, and so they even answered this question later on. Um, and so what they did was they looked at the Wasserstein distance. And so one of the, one of the proteins that they're interested in is this T-bet protein. So they, they plotted the H0 Wasserstein distance and the H1 Wasserstein distance against the difference in the mean um, T-bet expression data. And what they found was for, for, for a pair here in, in H0, the mean was, was, was very low, but the Wasserstein distance was very high. What this means is that the, the persistent homology is capturing differences which your, your traditional mean is not capturing. And the same happened for H1. Um, so their histograms look like this. So the means um, are somewhat similar, but persistent homology tells you something different. And this is the point cloud data. So the orange is your infected patient and your blue is your healthy patient. And so, for example, here, whoops, you can see that just looking at it, maybe you can't see that much, that, but the shape is inherently different, and that's what persistent homology is doing. Um, and they repeated this analysis for other types of cells um, that reflect some sort of immune response. Um, so, so again, with H0 and H1, they have um, a different protein, but again, plotted against uh, the Wasserstein distance, and they found that for a pair, a certain pair of healthy and infected individuals, their mean was very low, but, but the H0 distance or the H1 distance was rather high. And here, for example, you can see that, that the means somewhat coincide, yet persistent homology is telling you that their shapes look different. And indeed, you can see even here just visually that the, the infected individual's protein um, expression data looks different from that of the um, healthy individuals. Um, and so that's what persistent homology is telling you in a nutshell. Okay, so yeah. Um, I don't have much time left. I think I have about five minutes to go into the formal. Oh, I have 20 minutes. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, then I can, then I can go into the formal part of persistent homology, which I really wanted to get into. Okay, um, so yeah. So again, let's, um, so, so in order to do this formally, I have to do a couple of definitions. I'm going to bombard you with some definitions. Uh, so very formally, a simplex is uh, an n-simplex band by uh, n plus 1 vertices is just the convex hull um, of these vertices, right? And again, intuitively, it's just the generalization of a triangle. 
Um, and then sticking simplices together, you get a simplicial complex. The formalism is not particularly important. Um, okay. Yeah, it's not really. I can work without that. Anyway, I need more time. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, a chain group, right? A chain group. So let K be a simplicial complex, and an N chain is a linear combination of N simplices. Um, and so what does this mean? You, uh, an element... Uh, uh, an N chain looks like this, right? So you sum over CI and sigma I's, and CI's are your coefficients. And for us, they lie in, in Z mod 2, as mentioned earlier, and sigma I is just an N simplex. Um, so what does a one chain in our example look like? For example, sigma 1 plus sigma 2, because both of these are one simplices, and you can add them together um, linearly. Um, and the only two chain, for example, would be this, the, the sigma 3, because there's only one two simplex in our example. Um, and then CNK is just a free abelian group generated by all of the N chains where addition you do pointwise. Um, okay, and again, for coefficients in Z2, um, CN is a vector space, right? Because, because your basis is all of your N chains and, yeah. Um, so think of it as a vector space, not as, as, as an abelian group, and that'll help us later. Okay. Now I want to connect all of these chain groups together with something called a boundary homomorphism, which is just a linear map. It's just a matrix. Think matrix. Um, so define a homomorphism by, by defining it on the individual n simplices and then extending it linearly, right? Um, because our definition for CN was, was linear combinations. Um, so del n acting on an n simplex sigma, all it does um, is in the general case, it takes an alternating sum of the faces of sigma. Um, so, for example, in the triangle, if I feed del to this triangle, it would take E5 minus E6 um, plus E7, for example. But for us, in over Z2, we don't have to worry about these minus signs. Um, our life is much more simple because minus 1 is equal to 1. <laughs> and so we're just summing over the faces. And this VI with a hat over it just means that I'm removing that vertex from the simplex. Okay. And it's easy to verify, especially over Z2. It's a very simple verification that if you apply the boundary homomorphism twice, you get a zero map. So you go from CN plus 1 to CN via del N plus 1, and then you compose it with del N, and you get the zero map. And yeah, I'm not going to go into the proof, but it's, it's a very easy proof. Anyway, OK. So concretely, what does this mean? Let's, let's look at our example again. C2 is just the vector space. Um, uh, with basis this this triangle, which I've denoted A. C1 has the basis all of our edges, so E1, E2, E3, and C0 has as basis all of the vertices. Um, and so those are the vector spaces and those are the choices of bases I've made, and with that I can, I can write out the boundary homomorphisms as matrices. So for example, for del1, what does del1 do? It takes me from C1 into C0. Um, and so, it, it, so for example, if I feed it the edge E1, I need to spit out V1 plus V3, right? So, so in the position V1 and V3, I have a 1, and everywhere else, it's 0. And similarly for all of the edges and an analog for the del 2. And del 0 is obviously 0. Okay? So boundary homomorphisms are linear maps. Um, yeah, and we can do linear algebra on them. All right, so now we're ready to formally define simplicial homology. Um, so we have cycle groups, boundary groups, and homology groups. Your, your cycle groups, your n cycle groups, are just the kernel of your boundary matrix del n. Your bn um, of k, so the n boundaries, are the images of del n plus 1, right? So this boundary group is a subset of cn, so you're looking at boundaries, you're looking at n, n chains which are bounding n plus 1 simplices, which is why they're in this image, okay? And since we have this, this property, we have that Bn is a subspace of Cn. And hence, we can, do, we, can, we can form this quotient vector space. So Hn of k is Zn quotiented out by Bn. And this is well-defined because, uh, because, um, because of this characteristic. Um, and yeah, so like I said earlier, for us, homology is basically an exercise in linear algebra. So for example, the kernel of del1, you can check it, is basically um, formed by this loop, E1 plus E2 plus E3 and this loop, um, E5 plus E6 plus E7. However, for H1, I also have to mod out by the image of del2. The image of del2 would 
would be E5 plus E6 plus, e, uh, plus E7, right? Because it's bounding this two simplex up here. So H1 would be spanned, would have as base as this, and which you can write as Z2. Um, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> so that's H1. Um, and similarly, you can do it for all others. And yeah, that's the same thing as earlier. So computing hom a simplicial homology is just computing kernels and images of matrices, which is very easy for us. Um, so row reduction in del n gives you kernel of del plus one. And then for on del n, yeah, you get, you get the idea. OK. Um, and yeah, so basically, this is a repetition of what we did earlier with the Viatoris Rips complex. The only thing I forgot to mention back then was that the Viatoris Rips complexes uh, generate finite um, filtrations, right? Because at some point, the filtration stops growing. For some epsilon, it all gets filled in and you can't grow anymore. So, so the filtration is finite. And new simplices only enter the filtration a finite number of times because you can pick out discrete times. So you can pick out times one, two, three, four, five, for example, where new simplices enter. They can't keep entering um, an infinite number of times. Um, so, so basically, our filtration is finite. So given a point cloud data, we have a finite filter, uh, filtered simplicial complex. Uh, what's happening? Yeah, you have a finite simplicial complex. I don't know what's wrong with my pen. Yeah. OK, anyway. Uh, you have a finite simplicial complex. Um, K0 is included in K1, is included in all of these, right? Um, right, and then applying HK, so homology in the kth dimension, we get something we call a persistence module. So each of these maps are inclusion-induced maps, um, and I'm going to, to introduce persistence, uh, persistent homology groups, I'm going to make a few notational remarks. So the kth homology of Ki, so this is, so the superscripts for anyone who's, who's doing algebraic topology too, this has nothing to do with cohomology, this is just the indices for the filtration. So HK of KI is just, I'm going to write it as HIK, and similarly for the cycle and the boundary groups. Now, the pth persistent k homology group of KI, so this is the dimension and this is the persistent, uh, persistence um, groups. Um, so uh, HPI of this is, is, it takes the cycles that were formed at time I, and it looks at which of these cycles were, were removed um, at time P. Um, uh, sorry, which survive at time p. I, I made a mistake here. There should be. There should be survive, right? Yeah. So at, at, at time p, you add in all of the boundaries um, that that were formed um, at, at at the pth filtration, and you look if if these are now bounding out the cycles that I heard earlier. So are they killing off cycles that were previously alive? Um, yeah. So for example, here I would have. And again, I think I made the same mistake down here. But, uh, right, let's remove this. Um, right, so um, the, green, the green loop, it was born at time one, but it dies at time two. So it would be in this boundary um, of, of, uh, of one plus one, two. And so it would not be in the p, it, it, would, not be, it would not persist at time two. But the pink loop would be in H12 because it persists, it's still alive. And it would be all the way, it'll be in H13 as well, but not in H14 because it dies here. Um, yeah, and that's basically what your persistent homology groups are. Um, right. So now going back to linear algebra, calculating these persistence groups basically boils down to finding a common basis across this persistence modules. Because the minute you do that, you can, you can compute all of these and you can therefore compute this, right? So a priori, such a basis might not exist. Um, and, and, but, but because of some very nice algebraic properties and uh, for this, we need to work over a field, th th this common basis does indeed exist. Okay, so... A formal definition, a persistence module of a persistence module, which I'll need to do the algebra, um, and this is going to be the most technical part of the talk, um, is basically um, the following. So let R be a ring, and a persistence module M over R is a family of R modules, um, MI, and connected by homomorphism. So for, for phi from MI to MI plus 1 for all I. 
And we say a persistence module is of finite type if at some point these, these homomorphisms become isomorphisms. And very clearly for homology, for persistent homology, this is the case, right? Because for at some point, your, your filtration stops growing, stops changing, and so the homology also stops changing. So your, your persistence module here is a finite type. And our task now is to somehow use algebra to classify these persistence modules of finite type. Um, and to do this, we, we, we look at graded uh, modules. Okay, so algebra, interlude. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going, to talk, uh, I'm going to introduce something called a polynomial ring with standard grading. So again, let F be a field. We're going to work over fields, and FT be its polynomial ring. Then I can equip FT with something called a standard grading. I write FT as a direct sum of F subscript I, where FI is basically just all of your homo homo homogeneous polynomials of degree I. And a nice property of this is that it, it, this is an example of a graded ring because if you multiply two homo uh, homogeneous polynomials, so let's say degree n and degree m, you land in a polynomial in degree n plus m. Um, um, yeah, just because of how multiplying polynomials works. Okay, and now I'm, trying to, I'm going to try and make a connection between persistence modules and these graded um, FT modules. All right. So um, let n be a finitely generated uh, graded FT module, then we can write M in the following form. And before I, I, before I go into what all of these symbols mean, um, let me just give you an idea of where this is coming from. So this is completely analogous to the non-graded case. So if you think back to algebra, you have a finitely generated module M over a, a PID R, right? So it has to be, a, the, ring has to, the ring R has to be a PID now for us to get this classification theorem. So if, if M is a finitely generated R module over PID, then you can write M as the direct sum of some free part plus some torsional part. And if this still isn't ringing any bells, think back, set R to be Z, and then you get the very familiar part from, for abelian groups, right? So finitely generated abelian groups can be written um, as Z power N plus the, these torsional parts. Okay. And the same thing holds for finitely generated graded rings over PIDs. So F, F adjoint T is a PID. This is why we need to work over fields. So if you work over Z, for example, Z adjoint T is no longer a PID, which is principal ideal domain. Um, so that's why we need to work over fields. That's why Z2 also works. Um, but if you keep track of the gradings um, in your decomposition, uh, you can write your, your module in the following form. So your first part is still your free part. So you get N free parts. And this sigma alpha I basically tells you, shift me in the gradation alpha upwards. Um, so in the polynomial case, you'll be just shifting up the, 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 uh, the, the degree of the polynomial, right? Um, so this is your free part, uh, where alpha is an integer, and you're just shifting up the degree. And then you have the torsional part. So you're shifting up the degree by some gamma g, and you're modding out by t to the power ng. Um, yeah, and this, this characterizes all finitely generated graded FT modules. Okay, and now we're ready to calculate the barcodes. Um, so I'm going to first, uh, yeah, so I'm going to, so these FT modules are in correspondence, are, are in categorical correspondence with my persistence modules. So if I have a persistence module of finite types, so this is a family of R modules with, phi, uh, with, with maps in between them, I'm going to form an uh, F adjoint T module. So I, I take the persistence module and I, I sum all of them up. I, 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 put a, uh, I, I do a direct sum through all of these persistence modules. And to form an FT module, I still need to define what the actions of T are, right? Because I need, I need to see how, F, how, how, how FT acts on this module. So the action of T, and this is the genius um, of the paper, um, which, which introduced um, this and, and a persistence homology in this form, is that it, enc it encodes this phi zero. And phi zero you should think of as your inclusion-induced maps from earlier, right? So if you think of our persistence module as the homology groups, your phi zeros are your inclusion-induced maps between your homology groups. So it encodes these in, in, in the T. So an action on T, what does it do? It, it, it sends M0 to phi zero of M0. It sends M1 to phi one of M1. So it's, it's moving you along the filtration. And T squared, you apply it twice, and you're moving further along the filtration. Okay, um, and this is a finitely generated, non-negatively graded um, FT module. Um, non-negatively, yeah, it, 
anyway. But, um, and for those of you who, who've seen this terminology, what this does is, is the, uh, there, should be, there should be an equivalence. Sorry. It, it, it. So it establishes an equivalence of categories. So basically, given a finite, finitely, uh, a persistence module of finite type, I can get a finitely generated FT, finitely generated graded FT module. And then the structure theorem that we discussed earlier delivers me the barcode, right? So I take my module, I form a graded module, and then uh, from there I can use the classification theorem here um, to, to come up with my barcode. And, okay, so I can write alpha m in the following form. And how does this, how does this look in terms of our homology? Let's go back to our original barcode. Um, so for H1, for example, um, my gamma 1, my gamma 1 would be at time 1 because my green loop was born at time 1. So I want to shift the gradation 1 over so that my, my, my cycle is born at time 1 and not at time 0. So if you, didn't, if you didn't do sigma 1, your bar would start here, and we don't want that. Okay? And it, it dies at time 2. So moving over once in the filtration kills this cycle. And then if you move, if you take an element here, uh, sorry, an element here, and you multiply by t, or you act on t. Modding out by t takes you to zero. So it kills you even in, 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 on the side of algebra on your graded FT modules. And uh, for, for, the pink, pink, um, for the pink cycle, you're born at time one. So gamma two is also one. So you're only shifting the gradation one. But you're only killing it after three steps. You're killing it after one, two, three steps. So t you're modding out by t cubed. So once you go three steps, you're dead. Um, and so this is basically the correspondence, right? So more, more, more in detail, because um, if you have your inclusion-induced maps that take F1, so F1 takes me from one, H1 of K1 to H1 of K2 via the inclusion-induced maps, what does it do to my green, my green cycle? My green cycle here, it kills it, right? It sends it to zero because my green cycle dies in K2. Okay, what does F1 correspond to on my graded module side? It's the same as applying T, but applying T to some element here kills it because applying T is zero, uh, will send it zero mod T. So that's exactly what this correspondence um, establishes. Um, and so in particular, we can read off the barcodes. Um, so what does, what, what does this mean? Um, these N intervals, the, these, N, these N elements correspond to the intervals of the form alpha i infinity. So these are features that don't die. So if you think about back when we looked at um, H0, uh, which was here, right? So this, this interval, it didn't die. So this would correspond to one of, because the connected component stayed on forever, it would, con it would correspond to one of this, because no matter how, how much you uh, apply t, you're never modding out by something, so it always survives. And then you have m intervals of this form, and these are your half-open intervals. So gamma j is your birth time, and gamma j plus nj is your death time, because uh, applying it uh, n times will kill you um, in, in this side as well as in the barcode. And that's the mathematical foundation for why these barcodes exist, um, at least in the one-parameter case. So yeah, that was my talk. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Uh, we have an uphill in G69. Sure. Uh, so it's G69. So come to our uphill and, yeah. There's we can a common room. You can, go, you can go out here and over there and then to the right. The common room. Yeah. Yeah, and come next week as well. <laughs>